start recording now. It should be up recording. Oh, can you share your screen or do I need to be able to oh, share yeah. that feature with you? Uh, yeah, you need to enable it. I think okay. at the bottom it should say security and then under that you should be allowed to let me share. Here we go, I'll try it now. All right, yeah. Perfect, cool. Okay, so, sorry, I was looking at that recording button, just making sure it was going. Um, so everybody, this is my good friend, Travis, um, Travis Richardson. He and I, um, shoot, I think we met probably what, 2013, 2014, something like that? It was at least 2013. I think it was 2013 because that was, I think, going into your junior year of high school, something like that. Yeah. But um, Travis and I have obviously known each other for a while. He was my uh, training partner during the summers um, when I was in college and he was getting ready to um, transition into college. So we've known each other for a while and, um, you know, just kind of stayed in contact since he... Uh, he works in sports now um, as well, so I'm really glad that he's able to, um, you know, join us for class. Um, you know, he's going to be able to provide some really good insight on some of the, some of the cool projects he's been working on. Um, so, Travis, welcome. I'm glad, uh, glad this worked out with the time change and everything. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for having me. I'm glad, I'm really glad we could get it to work out. Yeah, especially with the internet issues that we were having, but I think we navigated those. Um, thankfully. So, um, I've kind of told the class a little bit about your, we'll say, career path or um, kind of progress since you graduated from undergrad a couple years ago. Um, but why don't you tell us what was, you know, like I mentioned, it seems like the sport um, management field, sport industry is just really, really kind of, you know, large and has a lot of different aspects, but what, uh, what kind of prompted you to, um, you know, pursue a master's degree specifically at Oklahoma? Yeah, so I guess my journey to get where I'm at now has been a little, uh, almost a little random, like there was never a point where I was like, in high school and I said, I, I want to go into this, I want to do this. So whenever I went to undergrad at Manchester University in a small school in Indiana, I went there for finance at first and I wasn't too into it. Like it was cool and whatnot, but I always knew I wanted to be in sports. I think it was my yeah, senior year of high school. Um, I was in a stats class and we got to do projects and all the projects I did, I in like incorporated sports in some way. Uh, I remember one project I did with uh, like transfer market values and if the player ended up being like a bust for the team they went to and I thought that was really fun. And then that year was the first time I saw the movie Moneyball and I was just like, man, that's, that's crazy. Like I would love to do that. And um, so while I was at uh, Manchester, must've been my, uh, going into my junior year, my brother, Tyler, he went to the University of Oklahoma for his master's in uh, information technology. And me kind of being the little brother looked into it and was like, oh yeah, I could, I could follow in those footsteps. Like that seems really cool. And in my head, information technology was kind of getting in with the uh, like the money ball type stuff. If I did IT stuff, I could go into sports. And then that year I was in a senior level class. Like I was the only junior. And so Manchester was small. So when I say only junior, I think there was only like 15 kids in the class anyway. But um, the very first day we had our professor when he was going over uh, attendance, he asked everyone to say what they wanted to do at the end of the year, since he thought everyone was a senior. And I think there was one kid who said like, oh, I plan on going here. Everyone else just said, oh, I'm, uh, we'll see what happens. And then at that point I was full on, I said, oh, I'm gonna go to the University of Oklahoma for information technology and I want to get into sports with that. And literally two weeks later, that professor sent me an email and said, hey, this might be something 
you want to look into. And it was an email from uh, the University of Oklahoma, the sports data analytics program, like exactly what I wanted to do. And so I messaged my brother immediately and asked if he'd heard about it. And he just heard about it. He actually was in a class with the professor who headed that program. So it was kind of falling into place with that. So my brother knew him, he could talk me up. I went to visit my brother, got a talk with that professor. And then before I knew it, I was at OU. And truly that was awesome for me because I've always been an Oklahoma Sooners like sports fan. My parents grew up in Oklahoma. I lived there for a little bit when I was young, but I, it, it was awesome to be able to go there, especially one, getting into the program that I wanted to get into and being able to go to football games. Like that was definitely the biggest perk is going to watch Kyler Murray every week. Um, but so yeah, that's, that's how I got into my master's program. Okay, so let's um, let's kind of talk a little bit more about the academic experience, like at uh, at Oklahoma. So you you kind of went in with kind of that sport analytics, you know, data type, you know, program. What were some of the kind of the key takeaways from um, that program, and then? how exactly are you kind of using some of that, um, you know, information or kind of some of, you know, the, those skills that you learn there in kind of, you know, working through, you know, your thesis. And we can kind of use that, use this question as kind of like a bridge to kind of start talking about some of the, uh, some of the cool stuff that, uh, that you've been able to do. Yeah, for sure. So whenever I got there, I truly had no idea what I wanted to get into. I, I signed up for grad school not really knowing what it was. I, I just kind of went in, thought my professor was going to give me what to do. And uh, so we immediately started talking about projects that I should be working on. And he was super into eye tracking and eye tracking and biking. Like all my advisor did was bikes. Like he him and his wife did tournaments, all they did was cycle. And so they looked at how, like while people were writing, what they were looking at, like what signage, and if like, depending on where they were looking, if they did better or worse in the race. So they did all that with eye tracking technology. And I thought that was pretty cool, like, but I didn't, didn't exactly know what I wanted to do with eye tracking and then this must have been probably after the first year we got approached by, or we we approached the athletic department that we had an idea we wanted to look into how people at games what they were looking at if maybe whenever they look up at the scoreboard so at OU it's a huge stadium there's a huge like jumbotron and we wanted to see if they were looking at the main jumbotron more if they were looking at the game more if they were if while they're walking around if they're actually looking at the advertisements and whatnot so that was kind of the first time i was really interested in what are the people looking at in games and then from that was kind of a little side project and then the first idea i had for my thesis it was actually i wanted to understand if attractiveness like if player attractiveness mattered for viewers so if the more attractive the player was were people more apt to watch that game and there's there's a ton of research that kind of backed that and but not much with mm -hmm. soccer and especially with soccer it's an extremely diverse like population if you just look at like the epl there's people from everywhere look like all different types of features and whatnot. And that's when it really sunk into me that, yes, I love sports and whatnot, but I care a little bit more about what the fans are doing. Because for me, yes, I played soccer my entire life, but after ending it at D3 and then going into, like knowing that I wasn't gonna go pro, the like performance side of it, 
I didn't care too much about anymore. Like obviously it's still cool, but since I was more of a fan, that's what I cared about. Like when I'm watching a game, what do I look at? So I cared about what other people looked at. And so I ended up, that wasn't my thesis. Um, I, I'll give back to my thesis in a second, but I want to show a few pictures of the eye tracking project that we actually ended up doing. So let me get to those pictures. I'll share my screen. Really what, what, what exactly do you, what, what exactly do you kind of look at? You know, obviously you, you, you watch a lot of sports with, you know, whether that's American football or what, like, is this project and kind of some of the slides that, uh, that I've already been able to see, is this pretty consistent with some of the things you're actually looking at when, when you watch a sporting event or how does that kind of line up? Um, a little bit. So what we noticed, so the project we did, it was digital eye tracking for the, we actually, the first thing we did was for the basketball team. Um, and they wanted to, they couldn't bring us out to a game yet because it wasn't season while we were doing this. So they wanted us to look at the um, digital media ads. So whenever we were looking, so I'll show one example really quick. So I think this is a combination of 10 different people that we set in front of a computer. We put, um, or they didn't wear the eye tracking goggles. There was an eye tracking like bar in front of the computer and it perfect, like you calibrate it beforehand. So it's like perfectly looking at your eyes and knows exactly where you're looking. So this is the combination of 10 different people's heat maps. And so with your question, it was kind of funny of like what I look at versus what other people look at. So with the digital marketing, it was kind of the same because digital marketing, if you just look at this, the main thing is, yeah, look at this player, but then they want you to click here for season tickets. So it kind of like, takes you to where it wants you to, but one project that I don't even know if I mentioned this to you, and unfortunately I don't have any slides on it because we did all the, data preparation or data gathering and preparation. And I don't know if we ended up doing anything with it because the guy we were working with went to a different company, but we worked with Oklahoma City Thunder and we actually got to go to two different games, two different home games, and we had volunteers wear the eye tracking goggles. And we had um, four different people do it. So they wore it for like a full half hour, I guess it was a quarter, then they would switch, they'd wear it for a quarter, switch. And so the first game we went to was kind of a test pilot and I wore it and then I went with my advisor and then he wore it. And comparing what, and we got kind of bad seats like up in the nosebleeds and then we got like 10 rows up seats. So we're, we wanted to look at what people were looking at during the game in great seats and then in bad seats. and it was kind of funny looking at what I was watching because you could see my eyes literally as soon as a basket was scored, I always looked up at the stats. Like I wanted to see, oh, that person scored. How many points do they have now? Oh, that person got a rebound. How many points do they have now? It's like, it was kind of hard to code me because I wasn't just looking at the court the whole time. I would, my eyes kept going over and up and over and up. And then whenever like one of my friends who volunteered to do it, really big basketball fan, he watched just the game. Like his eyes did not move from the court. And then we also had another one of my friends, this girl who couldn't care less about the thunder and her eyes were just everywhere. Like looking at other fans, looking at whatever. So it was really interesting to see different fan types. So the research that would happen off of that is you'd probably need to have different sections of like diehard fans, non-fans and see the difference in them. Right. So that was a really fun project actually, mainly because the first game we went to, I don't remember who they were playing, but it was when Paul George was there and he had a buzzer beater three pointer to win the game. So that was absurd. And then the next game we went to was against the, Pistons when Blake Griffin played there and he went to OU so like everyone in Oklahoma loves him and I think he dropped like 45 points that game so 
we went to two incredible games so and we got to go for free so that was really fun um but yeah so a few more pictures with this project um so as i said earlier you can kind of see what they want you to look at so on this one you look at the player i believe this was doolittle on the team so the red part is where most people spend their time looking and then you can kind of see it goes down to the click here and that's how it is for most of these but one thing i found that that i find really important and pretty cool is this gaze plot so this tracks where you look and in what sequence so in this picture, you can see um, the player like in action about to steal the ball, it looks like. And you can see everyone, or this is for one person. He started in the middle of the screen just because that's where your eyes are at first. And for this project, we had in between pictures, it was a black screen with like a white dot in the middle. So your eyes are just focused there when the screen changed. And then you can see you can't see the number two, but it's on his face. So they started and then went to his face to see who it was. Then they immediately went down to read all the words. They went over to see like, oh, you can click here. And then it went back up to see what else was going on up here. And if you look at that for the 10 people we had doing it, although this is a ton of data, you can't really see too much. Whenever you like individually take them out to see like, oh, what is green looking at? What's blue looking at? almost all of them number one started here number two went here and typically so you can see three and four on green is pretty big here so red was actually a little bit of different so he immediately went down to look at the words but most people started here looked at the players and then six seven eight were down looking at the words so that was that was really interesting to me to see how people looked at the, the advertisements. And then after that project, this was the next thing we were doing. So unfortunately, I left OU before I got to finish with this project. But this was at an OU football game. And as you can see, it was definitely before COVID with all those fans there. But these are what the glasses look like. So. They're a bit nerdy. So whenever we were wearing them at the Oklahoma City Thunder game, it was kind of funny because people would look at you and you could tell, especially the older people, they're like, what? Like, why are they wearing such goofy glasses? But you know, some people wear the most absurd things. So it wasn't too bad with the looks, but um, yeah, it's, but truly with the technology of what it is, the glasses aren't big at all. Like those glasses track everything your eyes are, look like where your eyes are and what you're looking at. So it's incredible technology. But um, yeah, so that was, that's the big side project I did at OU regarding eye tracking stuff. And that kind of led me into my bigger thesis, which, um, if we're getting right into that, that was looking at, um, so I use the EEG, which is a brain, I don't want to say brain scanner, but it looked at the electrical waves in your brain. Basically, it said how much activity was happening in the brain. So um, I guess uh, before I get into that, do you have a side question or anything, or do you want me to just get into that? No, you can, you can just keep going i think this is uh this is really interesting type stuff um, okay great um yeah. so i have a few pictures to go along with this stuff just because one the, i'm really proud of my thesis presentation i thought it looked awesome so i just want to show it again um but also it kind of helps visualize this stuff a little bit so this was just the title of it suspense and surprise neurological effects on the brain while viewing sports media content so what I wanted to look at with this, I guess I can show the purpose. So the main purpose of the study was to discern how sports fans are neurologically affected when watching a video presentation of a sporting event with varying suspenseful and surprising characteristics. So those were just kind of fancy words to say, I wanted to see how people reacted while watching sports. And the reason for this is there's a lot of um, research that says when your brain is more active, you actually 
remember and recall more of what's going on. So immediately when I read that, it made me think of, oh, so in high suspense games, we're actually subconsciously remembering more of the like the advertisements that are going on. So maybe if you're watching like, oh, okay, March Madness is going on, there's already been a few like crazy upsets. So if you're watching a game, it's 70 to 70 with 30 seconds left, you're probably just focused on the game. You wanna see who's gonna put up the last shot, what's going on, but subconsciously, you're actually remembering more of like, I guess, more of what you don't even realize. So those ads on the sideline, if after the game, there's been studies that show like after the game, they will have a list and say like, circle all the companies that you remember seeing. And there's gonna, obviously there's some fake ones to see if people are just circling whatever, but it actually showed that during more suspenseful events, people remembered more of what they saw surprisingly. So that really interested me. So this is just kind of like talking about the significance of it and it's just showing how teams sponsor stuff. Um, but mainly, I guess this is kind of getting into the background of it a little bit. So what suspense and surprise is and truly, the main thing I want to say here about it is suspense and surprise are, they create the demand for more. So if, and that's why I guess getting into a little more like wording. So uh, the uncertainty of outcome hypothesis is a really big thing with suspense and surprise. And it's basically saying that we care more about a like tight game than a blowout. So again, speaking about like March Madness, if we were just watching, so usually the like one versus 16 seed, the one seed is gonna win by 45. And yeah, that's pretty cool. But say, I think Gonzaga is favored to win this year. So say Gonzaga just beat every single team by 50 this season. They got into the tournament went through the first four rounds, won by 50 each game. By the time we got to the semifinals, we'd be like, okay, cool, like Gonzaga's gonna win, who cares? But if they're putting up buzzer beaters and like barely beating teams or maybe lost a few times in the season, that's what we wanna see. Like and the Cinderella the, stories. The, the Cinderella stories, the dark horses. Yeah, that's, that's what we actually care about. And so, for me now, being in Germany, I don't know if we established that at all, but being in Germany now, I think that's really funny because I don't know how much you keep up with like the Bundesliga, but I know you keep up with soccer quite a bit in like um, Bayern Munich. They've won the league, shoot, the past like 10 years. They win the Champions League. There's literally no doubt ever that they're going to win the German Bundesliga. It's just like, oh, all right, who's going to come in second this year? And it's that's no fun. Like it's whenever there's different teams that are that could possibly win, it's way more exciting. So that's what suspense and surprise do is create the demand for actually wanting to watch more. Um, so this is just talking about no matter like people's interest, what they want to see. So getting into what I actually did with it. So I had, um, I showed my participants um, a total of eight videos. So, and I didn't tell them what category the video was in. So the four categories were high suspense and high surprise, high suspense, low surprise, low suspense, high surprise, and then low suspense, low surprise. So um, I kind of wanted to show one of the videos on here, but it's kind of hard to show videos over Zoom. But um, so an example, like one of the high suspense, high surprise videos I had was, I think it was uh, 10 or so years ago, I believe it was uh, Wolves versus Leicester City in the FA Cup. And Leicester, the, so if you look at the score, it's kind of confusing if you don't understand like away goals and whatnot, because aggregate was a little different. But basically, the beginning of the video, a Leicester City player goes down, gets tackled in the box, PK. If he made that PK, 
it was so if the game stayed tied, which it was, game over, Lester wins off away of goals. So if he scored that PK, easy game, like no matter what, the other team can't win because it's in the 93rd minute already. He misses the PK, but the keeper saves it, stops it, throws it out. The other team counterattacks, they score, and because they score, they end up winning. So in that clip, you have someone missing a PK, a counterattack, the commentators just screaming. And so it's high suspense or high surprise because the player misses the PK and then the other team goes and counterattacks. Then it's high suspense because if you're listening to it, the commentator is just like, oh, if he puts this away, game over. And as soon as he saves it, the commentator starts screaming. Even if you don't know what's going on, you're just like, all right, like something's happening. And then they go down the field, they cross it in, and the commentator just screams, Dini! Because Troy Dini is the one who scores it. And he puts it away, takes off his shirt, and it's just so loud. And I had so many people after watching that one, they were like, I've never watched soccer in my life, but I want to go watch videos now. And so that always made me happy. <laughs> um, but then the videos I thought were the funniest were the low suspense, low surprise ones. Because because the participants didn't know what was going on, they were just like waiting for something to happen. So <laughs> one of the low suspense, low surprise was a, um, I think it was like a, fifth or yeah like a 50k race or something and I showed literally just three minutes of this guy running <laughs> and so many people would come out and be like that was a horrible video <laughs> so <laughs> I thought stuff like that was really funny but it was super useful because the low low is kind of the baseline so nothing was happening they were just watching the video and to also build up suspense I would have a slide beforehand like a powerpoint slide beforehand that would say this soccer game is in the 93rd minute. If this team scores, they win. If the other team scores, they win. But then for the running one, the slide would just say, this person is in a 50K race, he's 10 miles in. And that's all it would say. It's like there was no really right. suspense building up. So that's kind of like the methodology of what I did. Um, and then just to show a little bit, this is the EEG stuff that would come up. It's I don't understand this at all anymore. I haven't looked at EEG stuff since this time, but I thought it was a cool picture to show. Um, this is what the EEG looked like. And then, so findings from this. Sadly, I didn't get as many findings of as what I wanted. So basically, we were looking at how different brain waves were affected because different brain waves have different functions. So without getting into all that at all, we were looking at prefrontal cortex, whole brain, and then rest of brain. So the whole brain is obviously everything. Prefrontal cortex is just the front, and that's the most important part of your brain for cognitive functions. So basically that part of your brain says how you're gonna react to something. It helps with your emotions, it helps with memory. So it's really important for what I was looking at. And then rest of brain is, um, everything besides the prefrontal cortex. So I was looking at that compared to the prefrontal cortex. And there weren't significant differences in really anything up until alpha and rest of brain compared to prefrontal cortex. And it was a little bit backwards because the findings actually showed nothing at all. But when you do research into an alpha wave, if Basically, the findings that show looked bad are actually really good because alpha is backwards and alpha deals with um, memory and recognition and whatnot and how your brain conceptualizes stuff. So finding that there was a difference in prefrontal cortex versus the rest of the brain and alpha was actually a really big deal. So it showed that during while these people were watching sports, they there was a difference in how they were conceptualizing it. So this research, what I was hoping would do is lead into better possible like recognition and recall for like sports advertisements. So 
with more research like this, it would be able to help the like sports industry, the sports marketing industry, sports sponsorship industry, learn that, hey, we need to charge more for companies if they want to advertise at the end of the game. At the beginning of the game, yeah, maybe the, the first like five minutes, everyone turned on the game because they remembered it was on. So like a ton of people are watching at the beginning, but they it might not be too serious yet. So those ads, you're not wasting your money, obviously, but you're not getting as big of a bang for your buck as if you're at the end of the game and it's a super close game. And then at halftime or uh, sorry, at like some timeout, a Geico commercial comes on. And then most people probably won't even be paying attention, but subconsciously now like we can actually prove or from my study, like I could prove that that does matter. So that was, that was my thesis. And that's the main thing I did at OU. And it, it's kind of interesting. So kind of building off of, you know, where in terms companies are placing their advertisements, you know, kind of over the timeline of the game. It all, it almost seems as though some companies are trying to create suspense within their individual advertisements just to make things a little bit more interesting. Oh, it, no doubt. There's the sponsorship field has truly gotten wild since COVID-19. Um, and I hate conti- like talking about COVID and how it's changed sports because all we ever hear about is COVID nowadays. Like you're in quarantine right now. <laughs> but, um, so that's all we ever talk about. But truly the sponsorship industry and marketing industry, ha- it, especially in sports, has, I don't want to say dramatically changed, but dramatically changed like it it has shifted and um so my besides right now being a phd student i also work at sponsor united so what sponsor united is which probably the students listening to this most likely haven't heard of but it is a what's the best way to describe sponsor united it's basically a company data that gathering are, yeah it's data gathering so they provide like the most comprehensive sports sponsorship and media data possible and the way that they get that is through we call them scouts interns are called scouts and and also like managers and whatnot scout as well but what we do is so whenever i was in oklahoma doing this my main market was obviously Oklahoma. And when I became a uh, manager, it was also Kansas City. So we took on any team, any event, anything that was going on in Oklahoma, I had to know everything about it. Every sponsorship or sponsor, brand, anything. So with like the Thunder, just going through one team, I would have to go through their entire website, click on every possible um tab you could go on to see if maybe the they had like a sponsored kids club like I think one of their main sponsors is loves so maybe it's the loves kids club or something and we track that a specific way and then their partners page we track it as like oh these these partners are paying for to be displayed on the page but also if you click on that they have their own specific page section so we get everything through their a website then we go through their social media at least like once a week to see if there's any sponsored tweets or Instagram posts or Instagram stories or anything then pre-COVID we would go to the event and we'd get there like two hours early and walk around the entire stadium get any picture we could so like venue naming rights or if there were like tents and tabling from uh, what's another I think Sonic is one of their sponsors So maybe Sonic had a table for coupons or they were giving away corn dogs or something. So anything that was happening outside the stadium. Then once we got in, we had to take a picture of every single advertisement and sponsor we saw on in the concourse. So if we saw maybe there was a rug on the floor, like or not a rug, like 
a sticker on the floor for something or um, TVs or posters, or you'd have to go to their bar and see what, if they were serving Pepsi products or Coke products. And then during the game, we would have to get pictures of the rotating signage around the floor. And if they had maybe the t-shirt toss presented by Sonic or whatever. So everything that could possibly be scouted, we would gather. And once we had that, we put it into our uh, pro platform and then it's all there tracked correctly. So you know exactly what it is. Is it upper bowl signage, lower bowl signage, or where it's at? And then, so you do that with every team. Then what you do, then that's kind of our job for that team. Then, so say we have all the NBA scouted. Uh, the Thunder could come in, say that they want to use our platform, and what they can do with it um, so I've been on a few sales calls recently and what their first thing they always say is we're like the Google for sponsorship. So on our platform, you can go in and they can basically, they can go to their profile, see what we have tracked for them to make sure it's relevant or the thunder could say, okay, one of our biggest rivals is let's just say like the Dallas Mavericks cause they're close. So we want to know what the Mavericks are doing. So they're close in proximity. So they could go on their page see their sponsors. They can also go through the entire NBA. So they can see, oh, I don't exactly, how many NBA teams are there? 32, 30, I think. Um, so they could say, oh, like 25 out of the 30 NBA teams have an official tire sponsor. We don't have that. It's so like, who's everyone else working with? And they can see right. who everyone's working with. Or they could see like, it doesn't really help with Oklahoma because there's not too many sports teams, but say a team, let's go to the Lakers. They could say, oh, who are other California teams working with? And they could look at the Clippers or the Kings or the 49ers or um, the Giants in baseball. So like they can see who anyone is working with. And then we give them the ability to like reach out. So like, okay, everyone has a tire sponsor you guys want to reach out to Goodyear or do you want to reach out to Yamaha or I don't think Yamaha makes tires, but yeah. whatever. Yeah. So that's what Sponsor United does. And it, it was basically a perfect fit for me. Once I realized I'm really into the sponsorship side of stuff, I found this company and it's been extremely exciting. The company is only, I think three years old and we just yesterday, our boss actually posted a, or like the founder or CEO, he posted something on Slack. So it's an all online company, even before COVID, uh, that we work with 31 of the 32 NFL teams and 90, like 3% of all professional teams in the U S right now, like they're using our stuff, which is really cool. But I guess that was a really long story to wrap back around to say how being in that industry and working with them, I've been able to see, how sponsorship and marketing and just the sports industry in general has changed so much. Um, one example is in esports. So I'm also on the esports team at Sponsor United, and it is ridiculous how many teams are, or how many, like, yeah, I guess teams are becoming like or coming into that the esports realm like with professional teams and um different ways esports has helped through covid so i guess one way that like one example of that with esports and then with marketing um i don't know if you or if anyone watches like nascar at all but whenever nascar was canceled they did the like virtual races so they they would play the game like they would have huge setups with everyone and they would literally have a race, but it was esports, and it was, so they would have all of their sponsors and whatnot. And because they, I believe they did it on Twitch because of that Twitch is really like, it's already been up and coming, but because of COVID more people want to use it. And what you can do with that is have like um, logo pop up. So just in the corner, different sponsors are just rolling through the whole time. 
or it can be sponsored by someone. And on specific cars, like um, different racers' cars, they would have all of their sponsors on their car in the game or like in the, I don't think you call it the cockpit for NASCAR, but I know you do for other racing, but like you could see stuff in their car. So they made it as detailed as possible. And one, I'm sure like a lot of people have heard about this. So sometimes esports and marketing and all this new stuff is not too good. So I believe his name was Bubba something. I, I can't remember his name, but he was a NASCAR driver. And during one of his races, like one of the esports races, he wasn't doing so well. Someone kept bumping him. And there was like a two minute clip of him just like cussing. And he's like getting so mad that someone's hitting him. And finally, someone like wrecks into his car and like he flips and he literally stands up. He's like, I'm done with this. And like, cuss word, cuss word, cuss word. And he quit the race, like literally rage quit, like a little kid does in Call of Duty or something. Um, and on his screen, like literally covering half of his screen, it said Blue Emu, like that was his main sponsor. And as soon as the race ended, he tweeted, I can't believe I've made so many of you this mad. It's lit literally a video game grow up. The second that tweet sent out, Blue Emu cut out his deal. Like he lost his deal with Blue Emu because of that. Once they dropped him, all of his sponsors dropped him because he couldn't deal with how the sports industry is moving. And I think that's like such a good example of where the sports industry is going and you have to be able to adapt to everything. I think it's, it's interesting, especially with your sponsor United work shifting into the Bundesliga and you know some of the work that you've done recently with within that have you have you noticed any differences between you know kind of the the American professional sports industry and kind of the German professional sports industry have you noticed any trends or differences that are you know maybe similar or maybe completely different yeah, so definitely one of the biggest differences is TV rights. So another thing we do at Sponsor United is like you go to the event, get all the videos you can or pictures you can, and then also watching the game. So watching a game on their local like uh, like Channel 4 or something, and then you track all the um, commercials that come on through uh, for that team. So because it's a local channel, there are commercials for the team. But then we also track stuff through like um, NBA on TNT. So when it's a national broadcast, it's you track those commercials for NBA on TNT. And but it's cool because each team has their like local broadcast. That's a very big difference here that one of the main things is like everything is through like Sky Sports. It, like every game is through that. And it's kind of hard to find like individual games actually. So we haven't done much like broadcasting, scouting, and one because I don't fully understand it coming from the US to here. I don't really understand how their games work. And, and also- Sky Sports is almost like the uh, European version of ESPN. Pretty right. similar. Is that safe to yeah. Say? yeah, yeah, basically. Um, and it's hard to get games here. So in the US, if you only had cable, you only had like the basic channels, you're living in Oklahoma City though, your channel four, you're gonna be able to get all the Oklahoma City games. Here, it's not like that. Like you have to have a specific like Sky Sports channel for them like extra payment. So if I, I live near Stuttgart, so that's a big team in the Bundesliga and I can't watch their games. So they, I'm living in Airbnb right now. And um, so they have a TV and whatnot for me and there's a few channels, but I would have to like pay extra to get most of the games. So their TV broadcasting rights are extremely different. But I guess with 
other stuff within the teams. So one thing I've had to deal with lately is usually in the US, if, um, so we'll just do a soccer team since we're talking about the Bundesliga. So say you're looking at um, DC United. So that's my favorite MLS team. So if you go on their website or go to their game, you're gonna see banner ads and whatnot for whoever their sponsors are. Like they're, they're probably gonna have 10 to even 30, probably not 30, 10 to like 20 main sponsors. Like you're gonna see those all the time. You're gonna see those on their website. In Germany, and I'm not, I assume this is how it is in other countries too. I know um, one of the scouts or one of the managers that's in the UK, he's having to deal with it too. They care so much about local sponsors. So they have different tiers. In the US, it's like, oh, this is a sponsor. You might have a primary sponsor that's your like jersey patch. Like, oh, Volkswagen is this team's primary sponsor. Then everyone else, it's like, oh, maybe they're top tier or whatever, but kind of the same. Here, they have it built out to where it's like, this is their main sponsor. And then underneath that, uh, so for like Stuttgart, maybe they have their red sponsors, which are their like next three best ones. And then they have their um, primary partners, which will be like 15 more teams. And then under that, they'll have their executive partners. And that's like 45 more teams. And then under that, they have their regional partners. And then it'll be like, or not teams, brands. Then it'll be like 100 more brands. And then after that, it'll be their business partners. And that's anyone who pays Shugart to just like show up on the site. So if someone's a fan of Shugart and they need some like woodworking done, they can go on the site and be like, oh, this company supports my favorite team. I can work for them. And there's going to be like 250 super local teams that are business partners. And that's one of the biggest things that's like a difference is the teams here like love their support, like their brand supporters and their sponsors. So you, you can tell which ones are the official sponsors by like at the bottom of a website, it'll like only like 10 of them will show up and those are their main ones, but they still have specific sections on their site for the 250 other ones. And if you like click on their logo, it goes to their website or something. So Right now I'm having to deal with what are those? Like how do we how do we track them? And that's the most annoying thing because any of those new brands, we have to create them. And it takes probably like five to ten minutes to create a new brand and company to like you have to get their logo, all their social media, have a little synopsis about them, get their phone number, because if another company like sees like, oh, they're working with Stuttgart. We want to work with them now. They can go on our website and get their info. Like that's the main point of it. So you have to make sure it's like, we're really accurate in that. But whenever there's 400 new companies on the website, it's like every day, yeah, I'm, okay. asking, yeah, every day I'm asking my boss, like, do I actually have to track these? Cause this is insane. So that's definitely the biggest difference is they, like German teams want you to know who is supporting them. And I think that's awesome, but for my job, it's not awesome. Yeah, that, um, I, I remember you telling me a little bit about kind of the more recent work that you have done and kind of trying to categorize um you know trying to categorize where all of the new sponsors and you know everything kind of fall within um yeah. your system what so you for everybody that's you know watching via zoom or excuse me watching uh, via the youtube link once i once i post it travis is um currently getting his phd from a university there in Germany. So that's kind of completing the, uh, the Germany connection for, for Travis. What, um, what exactly would be, you know, obviously you have, you've gotten a lot of unique experience within your, you know, thesis work within, you know, that sponsorship, um, you know, sponsorship tracking within kind of the, 
um, you know, excitement and different things like that. What would be kind of the next potential like progression for you kind of once you wrap, wrap up your PhD program, would you, you know, be able to work with, you know, within, you know, sponsorship organizations, you know, trying to, you know, I guess, continue your work with Sponsor United? What, what are some other, you know, kind of, you know, jobs or, you know, opportunities that you could kind of pursue with, you know, some of this work and research that you have actually uh, done up until this point? Yeah, so I guess for me and speaking to like <clears throat> anyone hoping to work in sports, and we've talked about it before, the sports industry is huge like anything you want to do you can do it within sports and that's good and bad for me since I've kind of dabbled in like quite a few things throughout like sports like with mainly with sports data then with sponsorship with marketing and now I'm in sports economics like that's what I'm getting my PhD in and I can't lie I'm not the biggest fan on the sports econ side but I can kind of do other things with it so like this first project I'm working on is looking at suspense, surprise, and shock in games and seeing how those determine um, like fan viewership and whatnot. And for me, that interests me because going back to my thesis, like how is the fan viewership going to affect like marketing and whatnot? That's not where we're going with this first paper, but there's other papers that I'm hoping to work on that I'll be able to kind of get more involved with the sponsorship and whatnot side. So that's, that's really where my interest is as we've talked about and you guys can see that I, I'm really into the marketing sponsorship side. So after I finish this and hopefully write papers in that realm, there's a few routes like I could definitely continue on and try to be a professor which would be really cool i i really do enjoy teaching my classes so this semester i taught a class called the north american sports model and that was really fun because i'm just teaching these german kids who really enjoy the nfl i'm just talking about sports with them like they don't really know anything about how u.s sports work so i'm kind of an expert and i got to teach a class talking about the NFL, the NBA. Uh, my favorite part was talking about college sports. And for like two or three weeks, I had presentations about college controversies and like all the kind of bad things that have happened throughout college sports. So that was really fun to talk about. So I'm, I'm enjoying the actual like academia side of it. So that's definitely a route you can go in sports with the PhD. But then also, I, I love Sponsor United, so there's a thought that I could graduate here with my PhD and then continue on with Sponsor United and hopefully with this like higher education, I could move up in the company faster, have like a higher or bigger role, but also I've had thoughts that, so this next semester, I'm teaching a class, I think it's called like the theoretical and empirical views into sports sponsorship and marketing. So I'm using Sponsor United data in this class. I'm kind of like using these kids as like guinea pigs to see how we can incorporate Sponsor United into a school curriculum. So I think it would be really cool if I could graduate here, maybe do this class this semester, we really refine it and do it two more times. And then I graduate, stay with Sponsor United, and I could be a uh, like adjunct professor teaching Sponsor United stuff. I think that'd be number of different places. Yeah. I think that'd be really helpful for Sponsor United because it would be extra interns, extra hands helping. And then any of those kids, they would they've basically gone through the like internship process and then they could just feed right back into Sponsor United and have like the real internship process. And they would already be ahead of the other like scouts coming in. Um, but before I got here, so with just my um, degree from Oklahoma, there was a goal of just working with a sports team. And that's still definitely a goal. 
now that I'm over in Europe, I, so I don't speak German at all. I'm slowly trying to learn, but it's a very hard language. And with PhD and Sponsor United stuff, I don't have much time for <laughs> any, like others, like uh, learning a new language. So once I graduate, unless somehow I learn it in the next two years and can be fluent in it, if I stayed here, I'd probably want to go to um, like the UK and work in the EPL. I'm a huge Arsenal fan. So like that would definitely be a dream to like work for them in some capacity, whether it's um, working in their like sponsorship and marketing team or kind of like a broad, like the executive committee, kind of the people who are looking into that like economic data and what, what the team needs to do. I think that would be an incredible like opportunity or experience um, or going even like broader and bigger and trying to work in like FIFA or UEFA. So those are both in Switzerland and FIFA's like main language is English. I think for FIFA, it, you have to know English, like French, and then another language, but the main language is English. So I could do that. <laughs> Um, but no, that would, working in a large sports organization, whether it's Arsenal in the UK or FIFA in general, or going back to the States and working for like, even going back to Oklahoma City and working for the Thunder for their sponsorship marketing. Um, I think that's probably the path I'll most likely want to do as soon as I graduate, get back into the industry, work for a professional team or a professional like company that works with teams and get experience. And then with my PhD, you can easily kind of get back into academia and be a professor later. So I think that's, that's probably the path I'm hoping to go is graduate, get into the industry and maybe get back into schooling after. Right. I think one of the uh, one of the, you know, common threads from, you know, the other, you know, guest speakers that we've had, they've they've all kind of talked about internship type experiences. Why don't you talk? Um, it, this will kind of be the last question. I know we're kind of I'm running over the time that I've given you. Um, but why don't why don't we talk about kind of the internship? program there at Sponsor United. I think from, you know, a couple of the other conversations that we've had, you know, Sponsor United is looking for, you know, people to help within mm -hmm. that. So why don't you kind of talk about what, uh, what, what, uh, what that type of role entails with Sponsor United? Yeah. So yeah, this is a great plug in here. It's like if anybody listening to this decides they want to get into Sponsor United, it sounded interesting. Definitely apply and then tell Justin so he can tell me because then I think I get like free stuff from Sponsor United if I bring people on. But um, so yeah, the internship program, it is just with, just like with everything, it has changed so much just from when I was an intern until now being a manager. So whenever you start, it's called Sponsor University. So you get into the Sponsor University um, kind of academy. They try to make it sound, or not even try, they make it sound very like professional and like you're in this university, you're in this academy, this is what you're doing. And then once you graduate from that, you become a full scout and then that's when you can do your actual work. So during the Sponsor University time, you're, I think it's about a four, three to four week process I think three actually and during that time so I guess if while I was explaining it earlier it sounded like oh that's that's a lot of information to put in like how do you know if you take a picture of some billboard how do you know exactly what to track it as and that's true it is very specific what you have to track stuff as so in that time I think like the first week you kind of learn what Sponsor United is who we work with, what we do, why we do it. And then you, they kind of teach you a little bit about the um, properties that it can go into. So like this is a um, 
food and beverage industry. This is the car industry and how we break those out. And then the next week you learn more about kind of the platform. So how it can be used when you take this picture, what it would go under. So you learn about like the subcategories. So you take a picture in the stadium. So you know like, okay, when I'm tracking this, this is in the venue. Oh, I took this in the actual, like in the stadium and it was right next to the floor. So it's lower bowl and it's rotating. I can see it's moving. So I go to lower bowl rotating and then it's this. So you learn the steps that you have to get to, to actually track something. So every day you're either, there's, we call them speaker series. And this is really interesting. So literally what you're doing with me right now, like you're interviewing, we'll, we'll say expert in the industry, just to make me sound a little better. But um, they have speaker series usually twice a week with actual like full on experts in the industry. So they'll bring on the, uh, I don't remember who we had last week, but every now and then they'll bring on like the uh, chief marketing officer at the San Jose Sharks and she'll talk about her experiences and how she got there and what the Sharks are doing. Or they'll bring on a someone who used to be a scout for Sponsor United who's now working with um, like a sponsorship company that also works in sports and they bring on industry leaders literally like twice a week and they're incredible talks so you're not just learning about sponsor united you're also learning about all these other companies and so all these other companies all these other teams and that's one thing that sponsor united tries to promise like if at the end of the internship you don't work with us we work with thousands of different companies if you track them quite a bit and know like, oh, you tracked, going back to Oklahoma City stuff, like you tracked Sonic for 50 different teams, you know all of what they're trying to do, you could go work in their marketing department. So it might not continue in sports, but they try to give you the knowledge to work in the industry of marketing or sponsorship or sports. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so there's a speaker series and then you have like little quizzes throughout to make sure you're understanding it. And then the last thing you do before you graduate Sponsor University is you basically have your full, like a, we call them reports. So whenever you're scouting something, it's a report and you like, they basically give you 30 pictures and they say, all right, like track these and you like test your skills. And if you do well enough in that, I think you get two chances because it's a pretty hard test. Um, then once you like do, I think feel like 50% on it. Cause truly, even if I right now and took the test, I would not get everything. Um, so you just need to know like the basics. That's the best way, like knowing the basics and it's so easy to like continue on. Then once you pass that, you're a full scout at Sponsor United. So you go through the Sponsor University, which teaches you everything you need to know. You get great insights from industry leaders. And then once you're a scout, you meet with your actual like manager and then each week they'll give you like, okay, this week you are scouting digital for the like Milwaukee Bucks. Like you're going through their website and then you might get lucky enough to go to a Bucks game the next week. Like my first ever assignment, it was actually, so I think my first assignment was last, February because last January was when I was in Sponsor University then February is when we started actually scouting and so it was right before everything got shut down I got to go to the Oklahoma versus Oklahoma State basketball game so like I actually got to go to that game and so that's a really exciting experience so with Sponsor United you might get to you're not only going to be sitting behind your computer because like I said it's an all like online company so you're not just going to be sitting behind your computer you're also going to the events and finding stuff and it's not an all online company i was worried you wouldn't talk to many people but the camaraderie and togetherness that the company has is kind of crazy so we have just like a general channel where if you see like a new sponsorship you can post it in there and people will comment on it and we also have something called the water core yeah 
the water cooler, which if you're in like an office job, the water cooler, like the actual water cooler is where you go. It's kind of like your break room where you go talk to people, gossip and whatnot. So we have a community where you can post whatever you want. Then we might have themes for the day. So like the other day was window Wednesday. And you like take a picture of what's outside your window, people comment on it and whatnot. And I don't know, it's very surprising to me for how distant the company could be since we have people in like every state and different co countries it could easily be like oh you talk to your boss and that's it but it's a very like together company which is awesome and I promise I'm not just trying to talk it up to hopefully get some of you to know. <laughs> it truly is like an incredible experience and if you go on the site so just like sponsorunited.com you can see some like the testimonies for other scouts or people who've used it who say like, oh, this, this company actually like helped us find this brand. Um, to know like other companies and other students are saying how like great Sponsor United can be. And truly like, I believe that. Um, so yeah, it, it is, it's a great company. And I'm hoping from what I said, at least one person listening to this will think it sounds cool and maybe apply for it. Yeah, I think that just kind of recapping it, you know, the internship experience is something that we've really touched a lot on and just kind of how valuable it is. And especially, you know, with, with the type of work that, you know, you guys have been doing, you know, the more hands that you have, the help more helpful, you know, it is. So it oh, certainly yeah. sounds like there's, you know, a need for interns and scouts and, you know, it sounds like there's, um, you know, really helpful training type process to, you know, get everybody yeah. up to speed. So. Absolutely. What, what's your guys' like biggest city near where you're at right now? It would be Des Moines. Um, Des Moines. Des Moines. Then you have like Minneapolis, which is two, two and a half hours north okay. of us. Milwaukee is, you know, three to four. St. Louis is five. Chicago okay. is four and a half to five. So okay. pretty See, centrally located within a lot of the big, uh, yeah. big cities. Within the and that's honestly pretty good for sponsoring. Online. So you don't have to think like, oh, we're in kind of the middle of nowhere. We're, that's honestly kind of how I felt with Oklahoma. I was like, oh, we have the thunder. That's all. But yeah. Even if you don't, you're not living in a big city, because it's all online, you can scout all those teams anyway. And then you might get lucky enough where they're like, okay, are you willing to travel three hours to this like Minneapolis game? Yeah, like can you go to the game? So even if you're not in a huge market, there's still a need for scouts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I uh, I certainly appreciate your time, Travis. I'm I'm really glad this was able to you know kind of fit into your schedule with the uh, seven to eight hour time change, um, you know, with uh, with everything. But I I've certainly really enjoyed kind of listening, hearing your thoughts on things, kind of your experiences and some of the cool stuff that you've been working on. So I'm going to stop the recording now.